So this is Bhagavatam 5.24.19. These verses are difficult to recite for ordinary human beings. So, <laughs> so, na evai tad sakshat karo bhumidanasya yat tad bhagwatya ashesha jiva nikayanam jiva bhutatma bhuta paramatmani vasudeva tirthatmani patra upapunne paraya shraddhaya paramadaran paramadara samahita manasa Sampratipaditasya Sakshad Apavarga Dwarasya Yet Bila Nilay Nilaya Ishwaram. Word for word translation Na Not Eva Indeed Etad This Sakshad Karaha The direct result Bhumidanasya of contribution of land. Yat, which, tat, that. Bhagavati, unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Ashesha Jeev Nikayanam, of unlimited numbers of living entities. Jeeva Bhuta Atma Bhute. Who is the life and the super soul? Param Atmani, the supreme regulator. Vasudeve, Lord Vasudev, Krishna. Tirthatame, who is the best of all places of pilgrimage? Patre. The most worthy recipient. Upapanne, having approached. Paraya, by the topmost. Shraddhaya, faith. Param Adara, with great respect. Samahit Manasa, with an attentive mind. Sampratipaditasya, which was given, Sakshat, directly, Apavarga Dwarasya, the gate of liberation, Yad, which, Bil Nilaya, of Bilaswarga, the imitation heavenly planets, Aishwaryam, the opulence. Translation, my dear king, Bali Maharaj donated all his possessions to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vamandev. But no one should certainly, but one should certainly not conclude that he achieved his great worldly opulences in Bilaswarga as a result of his charitable disposition. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is the source of life for all living entities, lives within everyone as the friendly super soul. And under his direction, a living entity enjoys or suffers in the material world. Greatly appreciating the transcendental qualities of the Lord, Bali Maharaj offered everything at his lotus feet. His purpose, however, was not to gain anything material, but to become a pure devotee. For a pure devotee, the door of liberation is automatically open. One should not think that Bali Maharaj was given so much material opulence merely because of his charity. When one becomes a pure devotee in love, he may also be blessed with a good material position by the will of the Supreme Lord. However, one should not mistakenly think that the material opulence of a devotee is the result of his devotional service. The real result of devotional service is the awakening of pure love for the Supreme Personality of Godhead, which continues under all circumstances. Translation, next verse, text 20. Translation purport by His Divine Grace, Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada. Translation, if one is embarrassed by hunger or who falls down or stumbles, chants the holy name of the Lord even once, willingly or unwillingly, he is immediately freed from the reactions of his past deeds. Karmis entangled in material activities face many difficulties in the practice of mystic yoga and other endeavors 
to achieve that same freedom. Purport. It is not a fact that one has to offer his material possessions to the Supreme Personality of Godhead and be liberated before he can engage in devotional service. A devotee automatically attains liberation without separate endeavors. Bali Maharaj did not get back all his material possessions because of his charity to the Lord. One who becomes a devotee free from material desires and motives regards all opportunities, both material and spiritual, as benedictions from the Lord. And in this way, his service to the Lord is never hampered. Bhakti, material enjoyment, and mukti liberation are only byproducts of devotional service. A devotee need not work separately to attain mukti. Shri Bilva Mangal Thakur said, Mukti Swayam Mukulitanjali Swayvate Sman. A pure devotee of the Lord does not have to endeavor separately for mukti because mukti is always ready to serve him. In this regard, Chaitan Charitamrut Antya 3, 177 to 188 describes Haridas Thakur's confirmation of the effect of chanting the holy name. Keha bale naam haite hai papakshay, keha bale naam haite jivera moksha hai. Some say that by chanting the holy name of the Lord, one is freed from the reactions of sinful life. And others say that by chanting the holy name of the Lord, one attains liberation from material bondage. Haridasa kahen, namera e dui phala nai, namera phala krishna pade prema upajai. Haridas Thakur, however, said that the desired result of chanting the holy name of the Lord is not that one is liberated from material bondage or freed from the reactions of sinful life. The actual result of chanting the holy name of the Lord is that one awakens his dormant Krishna consciousness, his loving service to the Lord. Anusangika phala namera mukti papanash tahara drishtanta yaiche suryera prakash. Haridas Thakur said that liberation and freedom from the reactions of sinful activities are only byproducts of chanting the holy name of the Lord. If one chants the holy name of the Lord purely, he attains the platform of loving service to the Supreme Personality of God. In this regard, Haridas Thakur gave an example comparing the power of the holy name to sunshine. He placed a verse before all the learned scholars present, but the learned scholars Ask him to state the purport of the verse. Haridasa kahen yaiche suryera udai udai na haite aramba tamera haikshoi. Haridas Thakur said, As the sun begins to rise, it dissipates the darkness of night even before the sunshine is visible. Chaura preta rakshasadi rakshasadi bhaya hai nash udaya haile dharma karma adi parakash. Before the sunrise even takes place, the light of dawn destroys the fear of the dangers of the night, such as disturbances by thieves, ghosts, and rakshasas. And when the sunshine actually appears, one engages in his duties. Aiche namo dai arambhe papa adi rakshay udaya kaile krishna pada hai premodai. Similarly, even before one's chanting of the holy name is pure, one is freed from sinful re all sinful reactions, and when he chants purely, he becomes a lover of Krishna. Mukti tuchha phala hai namabha sahaite, ye mukti bhakta nalai se Krishna chahe dite. A devotee never accepts mukti, even if Krishna offers it. Mukti, freedom from all sinful reactions, is obtained even by namabhas, or a glimpse of the light of the holy name, before its full light is perfectly visible. The Namabha stage is, in, is between that of Namaprahat or chanting the holy name with offense and pure chanting. There are three stages in chanting the holy names of the Lord. In the first stage, one commits ten kinds of offenses while chanting. In the next stage, Namabhas, the offenses have almost stopped and one is coming to the platform of pure chanting. In the third stage, when one chants the Hare Krishna mantra without offense, his dormant love for Krishna immediately awakens. That is the perfection. O Magyanati Mirandhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnupadaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Itinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve 
कौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देश तारिणे वाचाकलूभ कृपा सिंधुभ्य पतिता पावनेभ्य वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासादि गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा so grateful to be here with all of you today and we see in this section of the bhagavatam especially in the purports of shila prabhupad his singular focus in focusing in highlighting the siddhanta the essential message of scripture this section of the bhagavatam is one of the most challenging for the rational mind just yesterday i got a message from a devotee he said i read the fifth canto i have decided to resign from krishna consciousness <laughs> i cannot accept this so this is completely irrational so it can be quite challenging so we, i said let's meet and have a discussion further he uh, said so mm, this is not just this is not unique it is it is quite difficult for somebody coming from today's educational uh, world view educational system and world view when confronted with the fifth canto in fact uh, bhaktivinoda thakur wrote an essay on the bhagavat and that was you could say his breakout moment it was his first major or literary contribution as a gaudiya vaishnava Bhakti Ram Thakur, as we know, was born in the Shakta family, and then he joined the elite at that time called the Bhadra Loka, and most of them were somewhat skeptical, skeptical about, especially Vaishnavism. But Bhakti Ram Thakur studied, and he said, "Mahaprabhu's life, Chetan Charitam, or then studied Bhagavatam, and then he came out for the first time as a Gaudiya Vaishnava, and there he empathized with his audience at why the Bhagavatam is so difficult to understand." i talked about three challenges he says the philosophy can sometimes seem very confusing because there are some sections of the bhagavatam which seem dvaitik and some sections which seem advaitik so what is the bhagavatam actually teaching the philosophy can be confusing then he says the morality can be bewildering especially krishna's activities with the gopis and the third he says the cosmology can be mystifying so philosophy cosmology and and morality all these three he talked about as obstacles for the contemporary mind in understanding the bhagavata now <clears throat> this section of the bhagavatam extends from almost the 16th chapter to the 25th chapter so we will see here the focus of the bhagavatam in one sense coincides the focus of prabhupada the bhagavatam is describing cosmology and it comes to bilva swarga mm -hmm. now without going into the specifics of the cosmology bilva swarga is a here the description of subterranean planetary systems so we have the terrestrial we have the celestial and then we have the transcendental about that terrestrial is the earthly planetary system celestial is the heavenly transcendental is which is beyond the material world and below the earthly below the terrestrial is the subterranean so <clears throat> so the those lower worlds are being described and the bhagavatam what it does is when it comes to bilva swarga it doesn't go too much into the geography of the bilva swarga how big is it how what are the kind of vegetation there is it a plateau is it a hill is it a what kind of terrain is there it focuses on a character over there and that character is bali maharaj and how he was such a great soul that he sacrificed everything for the lord and then the bhagavatam itself emphasizes that yeah he got he got this bilva swarga but one shouldn't think that this is due to his punya bhakti is very different from punya and then prabhupada taking that point further elaborates of the next verse that 
the holy name can give far far more than what any punya can give that sarva papakshay and mukti hai both of these freedom from sinful reactions and liberation from material existence these are just the fringe benefits of the holy name so from both the emphasis in the bhagavatam and the emphasis in prabhupada's purports what we see is that even while describing cosmology the focus is on the principles of spiritual life of what are the principles and practices of spiritual life in fact whichever area of the bhagavat of the universe the bhagavatam is describing it focuses there on okay these are the residents over there and this is what they do and most of them are worshiping the supreme lord in his various manifestations and where the bhagavatam describes those who are doing some other form of piety it also points out okay you know this is uh, this is not the highest that they are doing so in this way the bhagavatam's focus is not so much on cosmology as on consciousness it is describing cosmology but as soon as it gives a little description of cosmology after that it focus shifts to the consciousness of the residents who are living in different parts of the cosmos so the bhagavatam is primarily a consciousness conscious book <laughs> uh, its focus it's is on consciousness and how that consciousness can be elevated purified transformed so with this quick overview of what is happening in this verse i will now move towards the broader subject of bhagavatam cosmology so there are three difficulties so when i was talking with this devotee i was trying to understand no what was it that about the bhagavatam that he found so fifth, fifth canto cosmology that he found so radically unex, uh, difficult so i have tried to deconstruct it into three parts that when we study the fifth canto there may be difficulty in understanding i just can't make sense of it then okay i understand it but i can't accept it you know okay this is this is the particular world view but i can't believe it i can't accept it that acceptance could be a second problem and third could be you know i can't apply it what, what is it what is the relevance to me what is there to apply for me i can't apply it so let's look at these three difficulties in approaching the bhagavatam and see how we can address them so why is the bhagavatam's cosmology difficult to understand to some extent i'll echo what bhaktina thakur says in his essay on the bhagavat also now first of all cosmology itself is a extremely difficult subject to understand when we go through our normal life we face our challenges and we try to deal with the challenges but there are sometimes when we just become aware of how tiny we are and how huge the universe is how actually we live unconscious of the vastness of reality so whatever be the conception of the universe we may have but the universe is incredibly large and naturally anything that is so big will be difficult to understand after all we are just tiny mortals in fact according to modern science one of the things that they say is that religion makes people arrogant and science makes people humble <laughs> now what is their reasoning it is coming from the it's okay i think thank you so it's come from the judeo christian world view which held that the earth is the uh, center of the universe and humans are the purpose of the universe so they said when science revealed how vast the universe is then huma- the humanity was displaced from the center of the universe and thus religion which had made humans arrogant science made them humble So that is their idea but that humility is intrinsic in the vedic world view that not only are we a tiny part of the universe but even this one universe is among many many universes so first of all cosmology is difficult to understand on top of that the bhagavatam is not describing contemporary cosmology it is describing the cosmology in accordance with the world view that was prevalent at the time when the bhagavatam was composed 
So, just to understand why this is so difficult. And I was talking with a devotee uh, who did the Bengali translation of the Chaitanya Charitamrita of Srila Prabhupada. So I said, why did you have to translate it? Chaitanya Charitamrita is in Bengali itself. He said, he said, yes, but that Bengali is 500 years old. And today's Bengali people don't talk exactly like that. So, how it was that? that there was a, the book is in Bengali, Prabhupada translated into English, and now devotees are translated again into Bengali. <laughs> So, even for people today, the, uh, the same language 500 years ago is difficult to understand. Then what to speak of cosmology which is th thousands of years ago. So, difficulty is just natural and it's completely reasonable. And it is not just we who are having difficulty. Many of us probably know about prominent astrono astronomers in the Indian tradition like Aryabhatta and Bhaskaracharya. So, even Aryabhatta confesses in one of his books that the Puranic cosmology is very difficult to comprehend. Now, he focused on Jyotisha cosmology and I'll explain what that means a little later. But he focused on more on observational cosmology and inferential cosmology. We observe the universe and we try to understand it. And he came up with many findings which, are, which not only parallel but precede the findings from Western cosmology. So it is not just we today are having difficulty. Even thinkers thousands of years, th about a thousand years ago or a thousand five hundred years ago, even they had difficulty in understanding the Bhagavatam cosmology. And not only that, it's the tradition itself. We say, okay, he was not a devotee. But even Prabhupada, when he was commenting on the Bhagavatam, Prabhupada said that he gave his commentary and when devotees started asking him, you know, how do we do this, how do we do this, especially in the planetary verse we constructed, Prabhupada said that, you know, you consult somebody who is an expert. Go through the various sampradayas and find out if somebody is an expert in this. And devotees have consulted. It's very difficult to find out somebody who can give an intelligible explanation of the Bhagavatam cosmology. So, it's not just us, it's not just the broad Vedic tradition, but even the Vaishnava tradition. This is difficult to understand. So, the difficulty is not unique to the cosmology for that matter. If you study the if you study the third canto Sankhya description, it's not easy to understand, especially if you go into the fundamental characteristics of material nature, that chapter. There are many sections which will, if we really try to understand that, you know, we will we'll start scratching our head so much that not only the hair, the skin can come out. <laughs> so there are sections that are difficult to understand. So in general, our mood in studying the Bhagavatam is serving the Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam is non-different from Krishna. So we serve, just as we serve the deities, we serve Krishna, we serve the Bhagavatam. So we don't have to obsess over the incomprehensible. I can't make sense of it. Well, continue serving the Bhagavatam. Yeah, this particular section, when I serve it by reading, I understand it. This particular section I serve it by reading, I don't understand it. But I continue serving. Just like if we are serving some senior devotee, sometimes they may give us some instructions which make sense to us. Sometimes they may give us some instructions which may not make sense to us. Now, we obey as much as we can. So the idea is we approach the Bhagavatam in a mood of service. So difficulty is there in any subject which is really deep or complex. Even in, if you go into modern academia, there are some subjects which are very difficult to understand. Now the challenge is, that, okay, Sankhya cosmology, Sankhya analysis of the universe is also difficult to understand. But, Bhagavatam falls in a slightly different, Bhagavatam cosmology falls in a slightly different category. Because, the Sankhya analysis doesn't challenge our contemporary understanding. Okay, matter can be analyzed in different ways. There's the elemental theory of matter, there's the atomic theory of matter. So, the atomic theory is what modern science uses. That means, all matter is said to be made of fundamental components are atoms. But elemental theory is that not atoms, but elements are the fundamental components of material nature. That is just another theory. That doesn't challenge our conceptions of uh, uh, as strongly or as violently as cosmology does. Because the vision of the cosmos that we get from modern science seems to be radically different. And that's why there's a difficulty in accepting. Sometimes you may not understand some things, but then it's okay, I don't understand, let me move on. 
So we may suspend judgment. I can't understand this. I can move on with it. So what happens is that <clears throat> I was talking with one devotee who's in America, and just recently. So he's very fluent in English. So I asked him, you know, how generally Indians when they go to America they become fluent, but he was he was exceptionally fluent. So how did I become so fluent? He's an upcoming devotee, not a devotee. He, said, he said, I used to watch a lot of English movies. I said, okay. And how much would you understand? He says, initially I didn't care if I didn't understand. Just keep watching, and then I would read the subtitles. And then while watching the movie, I'd be looking at a dictionary. I said, okay, that's a very long cut way of <laughs> learning English vocabulary. I said that you know you could have better read a book and learn vocabulary from there. He he said that my point was to learn language, not watch the movie. I said that's an interesting way of looking at it. But the point is that there are so many areas, especially if you uh, some English movies, their plots are so intricate that just people don't understand what is going on. Even if you read the words, you don't understand what is going on. But people keep watching. So sometimes what happens is I'm going to that. Do we understand everything that happens in the world? Even when we read news, do we understand everything in the news? So just because we can't understand something, that doesn't stop us. But if we not only can't understand something, but it contradicts what we have know previously, then it becomes a problem. So what do we do with this aspect? So does Bhagavatam cosmology contradict science? Well, not necessarily, because. what science describes is not reality science describes a model of reality so what is the difference it's just like if we have a territory say we have pune and then we have a map of pune so a map is a representation of the territory but the map is not the territory to so similarly science observes the world around us and then gives us a model like a map mm -hmm. karl popper is a famous philosopher of science he said that science is the art of systematic oversimplification so <laughs> what he meant by that is now he's not a critic of science he we are not criticizing science over here see the world around us is so complex that we cannot possibly take all of it and process it so what science does is we look at the world around us and decide that these are the parameters of the world we want to study so okay what do we want to we want to study physical parameters physically measurable parameters length breadth mass uh, velocity density things like that luminosity so the just as when we have a map we don't describe everything in the territory in the map similarly science takes some parameters of reality and describes that and that's why science in one says leaves out consciousness science is not consider consciousness it just says that we focus on the physical aspect of reality so currently in america there is a infamous roe v wade case going on the roe v wade was the court case which legalized abortion all over america so what happens is america is a confederation so each state has its own laws some states allowed abortion some states did not allow abortion but then the case so the activists championing abortion they realized that by political legislation we will not be able to get abortion through so they decided to go to legislative means and they got the, they appealed to the supreme court and the supreme court at that time the judges were very liberal so they got this legislation passed so now currently it is being challenged and they are turning to scientific evidence so they are trying to decide when the when the embryo becomes conscious is the fetus fetus is not conscious is the embryo conscious okay yes no but then there was a philosopher of science who wrote an article in the journal of bioethics he said that actually speaking what to speak of allowing abortion when the child is in the mother's womb we should allow the mother the right to abort the child even after he is born when you made that comment it created a furor online yes oh, wow how monstrous does somebody have to be there are to actually even conceive killing a newborn child there are, you know even the most hard hearted people 
when they see an infant it brings out the caring tender part within them they want to offer care so his response to all this criticism is all of you are being sentimental just be objective from the perspective of science prince prince in the status of the embryo based on its physical location <laughs> whether it is inside or outside it is a negative difference so he did realize he had undercut his own argument so he was saying that if you can abort inside you can abort outside also but hardly anyone will think of aborting a child after they are born so if there is no difference then if the, then what is outside is also same as inside and if you can't abort outside then you should not abort inside also this is so the problem is that when it comes to science you cannot actually very very strict way quantify consciousness from the scientific perspective you know is the embryo conscious from the scientific perspective there is no way to actually measure whether you and i are conscious now we can study brain waves but brain waves indicate the state of consciousness they don't indicate the presence of consciousness they are two different things so i won't go into the technical details of this right now but my point i am making is that consciousness is not measurable by science so science leaves out certain things so scientific models of we are talking about right now cosmology so science offers a particular vision of the cosmos and scientific models i'm i'm in no way here trivializing or demonizing science i am simply contextualizing it that science offers valid and valuable tools for navigating reality just like a map if you are lost a map is very valuable in navigating reality but the scientific models are neither exhaustive nor exclusive descriptions of reality exhaustive means they don't describe reality completely and exclusive means they are not the sole descriptions of reality they are two different things so they are useful tools very useful tools but at the same time they are limited now if i tell say that the president of america is not the emperor of the whole world now is that a criticism of the president of america no it's an objective fact so similarly if we say that science does not have a monopoly on description or describing reality that is not a criticism of science science is a valuable tool but it is not the only tool for describing reality and even within science it's understood that reality can be described in different ways so physics has two different models of reality quantum physics and relativity uh, and these two according to some scientists they are violently contradictory um, steven winberg said that you know last his nobel laureate scientist is the last several decades we have made fantastic progress in science but the more progress we make the further quantum physics and relativity seem to be drifting apart so they are two completely different models of reality and the problem with science is in science usually the test is which model works that's real but the problem is both models work <laughs> both models work in their own domain so scientists are not just become pragmatic whichever model works use it and don't bother about how to put them together so richard dawkins not richard dawkins stephen hawking said before he passed away so i am happy to announce that humanity's quest for knowledge will never end <laughs> <laughs> what he meant that he just admitted that you know we'll never be able to reconcile these two together so so that the point is that not everything in science is crystal clear science does not have a monopoly that even on describing reality so just as science can have different models for describing reality even bhagavatam or the vedic tradition has different models for describing cosmology so even we may say okay this is science is okay science is after all speculative but even within the tradition the bhagavatam cosmology and jyotisha cosmology are two different cosmology model models and even the bhagavatam commentators like vishwanachakri thakur then they are describing they are they say i have to analyze the horoscopes of lord chaitanya or krishna 
दे डोंट यूज भागवतम कॉस्मोलॉजी दे यूज ज्योतिष कॉस्मोलॉजी ज्योतिष कॉस्मोलॉजी इज अनदर वे ऑफ लुकिंग एट द कॉस्मोस सो बेसिकली देर आर दिस टू विजन ऑफ कॉस्मोलॉजी विद इन द भाग विद इन द ट्रेडिशन ज्योतिष कॉस्मोलॉजी इट डिस्क्राइब एस्ट्रोनॉमिकल डिटेल्स एंड दो एस्ट्रोनॉमिकल डिटेल्स आर यूज टू make astrological calculations such as like determine the murta what is a good time what is not a good time and in contrast there is a bhagavatam cosmology which describes the universe and its residents for what purpose it is to appreciate how dharma and devotion pervade the whole universe and thus we can remember krishna more so these two are different models of the cosmos and they have different purposes so that's why okay i can't accept it well nobody is telling that in accepting bhagavatam cosmology we have to reject scientific cosmology there are two different ways of looking at reality for two different purposes so the two don't have to neatly fit into uh, mutually reconcilable categories we understand that reality is complex and there are two different models for two different purposes so we say but all this doesn't make sense is it reasonable is it rational so when we are using rationality in understanding the bhagavatam one extreme would be that we make reason our master if this doesn't make sense then i reject it i reject it but reason is reason is my master i need the sanction of reason to understand everything the other extreme idea is that we consider reason as an obstacle or oh, you know logic reason all these are obstacles you have to reject it all well that will make us irrational so the bhagavatam describes reality in a way that is both rational and transrational so we see reason we see reason logic intelligence all this as a valuable tool it's important but it goes so far it doesn't go all the way so the reality described in the bhagavatam is rational in many ways but then it goes beyond reason so jiva goswami says if if the if brahman if the ultimate reality is truly ultimate then that reality will be superior to our intelligence otherwise our intelligence will be supreme so we use our reason but we don't stick to our reason so it's like we don't let reason be our master we let reason be our minister minister means like advisor you take counsel from him the minister but we make our decisions that's why the bhagavatam is not irrational it's transrational once we understand that and i don't have to reject science to accept bhagavatam then it becomes relatively easier to accept bhagavatam cosmology and the last part is with respect to applying now so now when we talk about applying how exactly does the bhagavatam itself talk about application when parikshit maharaj has renounced the world to sit on the banks of the sacred river to hear the bhagavatam he is not interested in getting a phd in cosmology <laughs> that is not his purpose his purpose is what to remember krishna to immerse himself in remembering krishna and cosmology within the bhagavatam is one resource for remembering krishna tomorrow after evening i am doing a overview of the bhagavatam then we'll discuss more about how in the progression of the bhagavatam cosmology where does it fit in but the point is the bhagavatam offers many resources and cosmology is one resource and what is the idea over here the from the familiar to the transcendental that means that for parikshit maharaj he is living at a time when the the cosmology that the bhagavatam is describing that is familiar to him already the similar cosmology is described in the various puranas that is already to known to some extent to him so what the what the what shukdev goswami is doing is okay what was already in his consciousness the cosmology as described in the bhagavatam it is already in his consciousness what shukdev goswami is doing is showing him how there is krishna throughout how to see krishna within the cosmology so what is already in his consciousness okay how to see krishna within that conscious how to see krishna within that that was the purpose of the bhagavatam 
Bhagavatam's description of cosmology. So just like when Prabhupada started the Bhaktivedanta Institute, he wanted devotees to scientifically establish the basis of Krishna consciousness. Now, does that mean that every single person who, ha- who comes to the Krishna consciousness movement has to study science? Not necessarily. Now, science, modern science is already in the minds of people. Then, okay, through modern science, how can you see Krishna? So, what is already familiar for us, use what is familiar, use what is already in our mind to take that, take our mind, our consciousness towards Krishna. But now for us, what happens? So, so this works very well for Shukdev was Parikshit Maharaj because he's already familiar with Bhaktam cosmology. But for us, it is from the unfamiliar to the transcendental. <laughs> so our situation is that the Bhagavatam cosmology is not already in our consciousness. It's not a part of our culture. It's not a part of our education. So maybe if we went to some traditional temples and we saw some Meru Parvat or something like that. But you know, that was never a prominent part of our consciousness. Unless, of course, you are very ex- some of you are very exceptional. But so it's all unfamiliar for us. So now we don't have to first bring the Bhagavatam's cosmology into our consciousness and then bring Krishna into the cosmology. You know, we can just directly focus on bringing Krishna into our consciousness. And that means there are so many other sections in the Bhagavatam which we can read, which we can relish, which we can focus on and that can immerse our consciousness in Krishna. So here we are seeing the cosmology in the light of the purpose of the Bhagavatam. To apply the Bhagavatam means to remember Krishna. And for Parikshit Maharaj, cosmology helped him to remember Krishna. For us, the cosmology may, may just be like a, not a devotionally absorbing activity. It may just be like an intellectually exhausting activity. So how do I figure this out? What do I do? So we don't have to necessarily exhaust ourselves that way. And that's why this is how we need to approach Bhagavatam with a devotional purpose. And approaching Bhagavatam with a devotional purpose means we avoid the extremes of absolutizing and relativizing. Absolutizing means every single section of the Bhagavatam is equally important for every sadhaka to study. (coughs) Yes, every section of the Bhagavatam is important, no doubt about that. But is every section of the Bhagavatam equally important for everyone to study? Not necessarily. But when Prabhupada was not sure whether he would live long enough to be able to translate the whole Bhagavatam, what did he do? He gave Krishna a book. He considered that the most important. So, when Prabhupada was himself asked by a professor, which do you consider the most important among your teachings? So, Prabhupada quoted 1.2.9 and 10, where he talked about how, what is the purpose of life? Kamasthine indre prite labho jiva tayavata, jiva setatva jigata, those verses. So, so, there is, in one sense, every section of the Bhagavatam is important. In another section, sense there is a hierarchy. I'll explain how that hierarchy works. So, absolutizing every section of the Bhagavatam doesn't work. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu it is said that he would like to hear the stories of Dhruva and Prahlad hundreds of times. Why not the story of Vara? Why not the story of Amana? Well, he's a person. He's a person who's attracted to the Supreme Person. So, we don't have to absolutize everything. Now, the fear, whenever we say don't absolutize, the fear is, then do we relativize? No. Absolutizing and relativizing are two extremes. Relativizing means, hey, this is not true, this is not valid, this is not, this is, this is just reject it. It's all relative. Well, we're not relativizing. Between absolutizing and relativizing is contextualizing. Contextualizing means what? That, that the Bhagavatam is spoken at a particular time in a particular context. And certain sections of the Bhagavatam may be more relevant in particular contexts and less relevant in other contexts. So we are not saying that there is a difference between relevance and validity. When we relativize, we say they are not valid only. When we are saying about contextualizing, what is relevant, what is applicable for me? So we understand that certain sections of the Bhagavatam may not be that helpful for me in remembering Krishna. 
and other sections of the bhagavatam may be much more helpful for me in remembering krishna so what do we do we focus on those sections which enhance our remembrance of krishna we don't we don't reject we don't min- minimize we don't mythologize the bhagavatam cosmology we respect it but that need not be our priority in studying the bhagavatam so we approach the devotional purpose and the application of the bhagavatam is to help us remember krishna so bhagavatam cosmology is a resource for us in remembering krishna so one extreme to insist that this is a resource that everyone has to utilize everyone has to study bhagavatam cosmology thoroughly well krishna doesn't say he doesn't say and it doesn't say at the end of your life you have to remember bhagavatam cosmology to come to me it says at the end of the life your life you have to remember me to come to me so as the other ways reject bhagavatam cosmology it's all a distraction well it's not a distraction it just may not be what is relevant for us now for whom is the bhagavatam cosmology as a resource valuable for those who are already interested in cosmology now those who are already interested especially in traditional conceptions of cosmology so there are dedicated devotees who are doing research in this field to try to understand it to try to present it and it has its importance but does it have a prior such a great importance that we have to focus only on that no my point is that what are prabhupa did not start the international society for bhagavatam cosmology explanation is the international society for krishna consciousness and bhagavatam cosmology is a aid in that it is a tool in that so what i spoke today i try to briefly summarize to this devotee and he, he told me okay you know i have not yet changed my mind but i have decided to suspend my resignation <laughs> 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 so let me think a little bit more about it now let me think so ultimately you know it is the krishna consciousness is a matter of consciousness once the heart experiences krishna then everything else will will be seen in context not that it will become unimportant but it will be seen in context so as devotees we sometimes have to be careful that we don't make people feel that you have to reject science or reject rationality in the name of faith have faith in the bhagavatam how can you not have faith no you cannot guilt people into having faith <laughs> <laughs> faith is at one level rationally developed another level it is divinely gifted means we use our reason our logic to understand things log- and then by that we develop some faith and otherwise it is divinely gifted faith comes when we practice bhakti and do seva and we get the blessings of the vaishnavas then we get faith but it is not that faith requires us to reject reason that is not the point of faith faith doesn't require us to reject reason faith requires us to transcend reason yes reason takes us so far but there are domains of consciousness and domains of reality which go beyond what reason can take us so let's be open to exploring it and the bhagavatam takes us not just to cosmology it takes us beyond the cosmology to to the abode of the supreme lord and we also need to focus on on going toward that abode at least taking our consciousness toward the supreme lord of that abode our beloved lord shri krishna so i'll summarize I spoke today about in this section of the Bhagavatam although describing cosmology the Bhagavatam is consciousness conscious focusing on the consciousness of Bali Maharaj and what consciousness is he giving he offered himself not to gain a bigger kingdom like that and Prabhupada is also focusing on the practices and principles of spiritual life which will elevate our consciousness so then with respect to difficulties in approaching the Bhagavatam I discussed three difficulties first is understanding itself and bhakti thakur acknowledges that cosmology morality and philosophy may be difficult to understand in the bhagavatam so but the cosmology itself is a difficult naturally because the cosmos is so vast and it is not that in every area of life that we study we understand everything so even if we don't understand we continue serving the bhagavatam um, and for that purpose the problem may come let's say sankhya may be difficult to understand it's not that we alone aryabhatta had difficulty in asli prabhupada said go to some specialist to understand it so it's not unique then problem is that 
it seems to contradict science that's why we can't just let it leave it aside how do i accept it so then we discuss that it doesn't necessarily contradict science science offers a model of reality which can be valid and valuable but it is neither exclusive nor exhaustive there can be other alternate visions of reality and even within the indian cosmological tradition itself there are alternate visions of the cosmos a jyotish cosmos which was cosmology for astrological astronomical purposes and bhagavatam cosmology is more for contemplative devotional purposes so just as our acharyas did not hesitate did not see consider as unfaithful to bhagavatam to use jyotish cosmology although it was different from bhagavatam cosmology so we don't have to make it a competition between bhagavatam cosmology and modern scientific cosmology there are two different visions of reality for two different purposes just like scientists are pragmatic in terms of using both quantum physics and relativity so we can be pragmatic for navigating the world we can use modern cosmology for raising our consciousness we can use bhagavatam cosmology then how to apply this the purpose of bhagavatam is to help us remember krishna and for parikshit maharaj the cosmology was already familiar so from familiar to the transcendental for us it is unfamiliar so we don't have to bring the cosmology into our consciousness and then bring, bring krishna into it he is directly bring krishna through the other resources offered by the bhagavatam this does not mean that we are we are trivializing bhagavatam cosmology we discuss the two extremes of absolutizing and relativizing and between is contextualizing and bhagavatam cosmology is a valuable resource for those who are already interested in the cosmology and especially traditional conception of cosmology they can go deep they can understand they can specialize and for those of us interested they can explain but for most of us we focus on remembering krishna and raising our consciousness towards him we don't have to reject reason in understanding the bhagavatam and approaching krishna we have to accept reason but accept it that there is reality beyond reason also the bhagavatam is not describing something that is irrational it is describing a reality that is rational and transrational thank you very much hare krishna I know we are already a little over time. One question, if somebody has. Oh, <laughs> okay. Krishna Guru. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure hearing you. So, as you were, uh, you know, mentioning in the class, uh, I was thinking on this point. I'll make that and then ask the question. You were saying that. Um, people used uh, the jyotish shastra for astrological ast purposes so i was just thinking that traditionally it, it's something very amazing how people did it uh, when they had to do some samskar whether it's a wedding anything they would use the principles of jyotish shastra and the panchanga to calculate the muhurta and when to do but when they would sit for that ceremony and they would do the sankalpa that time it was the puranic cosmology they would bring yeah. in saying you know bharat uh, bharat varsha yeah, bharat exactly. kande sumero ho dakshine parshve you know that whole sankalpa if you see that is not according to the uh, jyotisha so so right so the, and then they would say this is the manvantara ashta vimshate kaliyuge prathame pade you know they would say the whole thing that means the time and place when they would do sankalpa it would be according to the puranic but the 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 actual calculation of when to do itself was according to a completely different thing so how, how do you think that these people you know i mean and this is going on since yeah. we can say you know forever because that's how it has been always so how do you think these people managed to uh, you know ma integrate both into their system because it is not that the bhagavatam uh, cosmology did not have a role Yeah. it had a role you know even now in any course, any wedding anything any yeah, death anything yeah. yeah two things first is that this is a characteristic of the eastern wisdom tradition that it is comfortable with uncertainty <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's like actually it comes from greek oleomic tradition i think plato uh, plato had his principle of non contradiction say if a is true and b is b is the opposite of a then b cannot be true and that's like a cardinal basis of western thinking 
to so that's why it's this or that hmm? but eastern thinking is more this and that that's why is god personal or impersonal he is both he is both personal and impersonal so that the eastern way is more of and than or now sometimes how the two and come together is quite difficult to figure out <laughs> but the point is that comfort with uncertainty is a characteristic of the eastern tradition i'm not saying that means it's a all it's a free fall all for anything and everything there's a lot of room for a reason and this is right this is wrong that kind of discrimination is always there but comfort with uncertainty is a characteristic of uh, of uh, answer how should i put it see sometimes uh, when we talk about faith we often equate faith with certainty you know i have faith in this i'm certain about this but actually speaking certainty may not always arise from faith certainty may arise from ego that no i want to portray to the world how much faith i have and that's why i make statement like that or certainty can arise from the opposite of ego also that is insecurity i don't want others to know my faith is insecure so i will make very bombastic faith proclamations so certainty doesn't always arise from faith and on the other side uncertainty may not always arise from lack of faith uncertainty can also arise from humility the universe is so big reality is so big that i don't know how things work so that's why when i say uncomfortable comfortable with uncertainty that does not mean lack of faith it could just mean humility when we are approaching a reality that is very complex that's the first point and the second point is that with respect to the <clears throat> with respect to the rituals that were performed see over the centuries uh, there was a significant uh, i don't want to use the word di- divorce but at least a differentiation between the ritual aspect and the philosophical aspect of the broad vedic tradition rituals went on fairly well but the philosophy behind that that was not so widely understood or so widely disseminated so i have talked with this when i was working on the cosmology project i talked with this with the uh, danvir maharaj and others you know he also mentions the point that it is not that this particular cosmology is unknown in today's india also because when they are ma- weddings and other ceremonies they talk about this cosmology it's there very much but even if you ask most priests who are talking about this they don't know much more than that is a mantra they chant so the ritual and the philosophical aspects they have often been uh, quite separate the rituals went on well the philosophy not so much so when our devotees were doing the cosmology project they went to other traditions and experts and there many learned scholars many very learned but two things to actually reconcile bhagavatam cosmology with jyotisha cosmology so that we can get a picture that makes sense and that can be depicted that was one challenge and then to make sense of that picture of the universe with respect to the picture of the universe that we get from modern cosmology that is another challenge so it is still a challenge that has to be negotiated and uh, in my understanding there is see what happened within uh, india as the islamic rule came in the patronage for the brahmana intellectuals went down the patronage for the brahmana who were doing rituals continued on because rituals were still performed hmm? people wanted to do marriages people wanted to do all those things so rituals were so that's why there's a significant intellectual gap with the tradition so it will require a lot more research to be able to reconcile bhagavat to understand not even to reconcile to at least understand how it was reconciled in the past thank you yes so should we go ahead and you can tell me how much time antadeep prabhu yes prabhu priji uh, i personally when i went through it in my heart i didn't feel any problem because i saw it as uh, because even even if i call myself not having faith from the transcendence but actually even the science talks so much about the higher dimensions and from high dimensions you can reconcile everything actually because it is possible to have sun nearer to the moon nearer to the earth than the moon by simply seeing from a, from a high dimensional science 
So when we see things, even if we see consciousness as one dimension, you can change so many parameters uh, around that. You change your consciousness, you can see another world in the same place. Like as a divine soul sees all of us as souls. And we are some, many of the people on the body consciousness will see as bodies. So on the consciousness platform, we can see many things which we may not see on another platform, on a higher consciousness I'm talking. So when actually science is already giving you an equipment, a tool by which you actually can see things at a different platform if you have. So then why we have to actually, I understand okay. the, the problem that people are in, hmm. but when science has given a tool which just makes them accept this reality also. Okay, yeah. So, so since science also recognizes that there are multiple dimensions to reality and things may be per, things are perceived differently from different dimensions. So then, is this such a big problem accepting Bhagavatam cosmology? Yeah, it's a, it depends on how deep you want to go into science, but there are, there are quite a few, there are scientists who consider themselves like guardians of science and scientific rationality. So they say that, that this whole idea of higher dimensions, you know, it is used by any and every religious tradition to try to justify their beliefs. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there are there are there are what are called a young earth creationists who say the the earth is just six thousand years old, and they have they are scientists, or they have their scientific way of justifying that. So now, so what they say is what do what do higher dimensions in science mean, and what do they not mean? Now, of course, their, their boundaries that they set, it's not that all the scientific world accepts that. But in general, uh, science through its higher dimensions recognize, so what I talked about, that science offers a model of reality. Mm -hmm. And it is not exclusive, it is not exhaustive. This is something which even most scientists will admit. See, most people who are into science, they're not into the philosophy of science. So they may not even be th think about these things so much. But they, do, they, do, they will accept these things. But just because there can be multiple models of reality, does that mean that they will accept a model of reality, that a model of reality which involves uh, a giant uh, turtle at the bottom of the universe or things like that, they, they are not necessarily immediately acceptable. So I would use this a little, I talk about this with Dutta Karma Prabhu. So he prefers, he says, science uses the word dimensions in a particular technical sense. He says, I prefer the word levels rather than dimensions. There are levels of reality. Because dimensions are like a length, breadth, height, and there are some more dimensions. So dimension has a very specific meaning in science. So he prefers the word levels of reality. So all that we can say is that there, with, that there is abundant basis within science to substantiate that there can be different views of reality. But whether a particular view of reality is right or not, that will have to be defended on its own strength. So just because there are, uh, there are many, many views of reality. So if somebody says that, therefore we can say that Satan is God. And that's also one view of reality. Now does, does science accept that? No. Even theology doesn't accept that. So, yes, there can be openness to multiple levels of reality. But after that, is what the Bhagavatam describing also one level of reality? That will have to be defended in its own way, explained in its own way. So, openness is possible, definitely. Okay? So, openness will be there and then when we talk about why we actually have faith in science, most people, is because it gave us fan and light, because it gave something practical. So if the, the Bhagavatam cosmology, whatever it is explaining, if it is also able to explain the phenomena of the world, then they have no, no just like quantum mechanics and real, relativity, they have accepted even if they are not able to re reconcile things, because they see that it works. Similarly, if Bhagavatam cosmology works, they have no way to actually yeah, exactly. that was that. what Prabhupada told in the letter to his scientist disciple that there are four things if you can explain the phases of the moon the eclipses the variation of the seasons or the I don't remember the fourth one 
day night alteration yeah so there's four things if you can explain the bhagavatam cosmology then that will also be acceptable model of reality so that's what our devotees are trying to do okay. thank you yes bro hari krishna uh, thank you very much for the class the systematic presentation as always my question is uh when you said even from traditional perspectives there is this bhagavatam cosmology and there is this jyotish cosmology and then the scientific world which gives models of the actual reality the fact being everything is so complex we just cannot understand but we can have different perspectives to the actual reality this is a factual thing the reality is so complex we cannot comprehend we cannot comprehend everything about it so depending on the context contextualizing the presentation there could be so many presentations but the fact is being in the universe we need some operational knowledge yeah for that which one do we refer to and continuing from what he said whichever gives us the whichever gives us the easiest and the most accessible explanation for operational reasons is the one which is most widely accepted yeah so then how for uh, understand understanding all this complexity which is the text or body of knowledge that we should look for to fulfill our operational requirements of being in this existence okay so for operating in the world which body of knowledge do we use i think in my understanding prabhupad was very pragmatic see prabhupad see prabhupad preferred ayurveda but he didn't insist on ayurveda that all his disciples in order to be faithful, faithful to krishna consciousness they all have to be ayurvedic take ayurveda medicine only In fact, when he was in America, he also had a procedure. Not in America, in London, he had a procedure done, which is completely allopathic. So, with respect to the world, we need to be pragmatic. Never don't make it into faith issue. That faith issue means what? Yeah, if you are building a house, should it be according to house too? Yes, as much as possible. Yes, but does that mean that a devotee cannot have a house which is not according to house too? Not necessarily. So, in my understanding, the world. is complex and whatever tools work we use those tools language is a tool so right now we are speaking in english is it that to be faithful to our tradition all of us have to learn sanskrit or bengali and speak in sanskrit or bengali if we can wonderful if not doesn't matter whatever language works is good enough so in the world for navigating the world we can be pragmatic so if modern cosmology helps for us in functioning in the world that's fine we use that as a tool and galileo was being persecuted at that time he said that he said he he phrased the how to reconcile he said that he says that the bible tells how to go to heaven science tells how the heavens go <laughs> how the heavens go means how do the celestial objects move so he says the, the, the motions of them are described by science but how we go to the heavens how we raise our consciousness that's up to that's up to that's the that's the bible in this case as spiritual text so basically there is the outer world as the inner world science can help us improve the outer world and now some devotees may see, see there are broadly prabhupada had two strands in his outreach one is you could say uh cultural warfare and the other was cultural integration or penetration that means sometimes prabhupada would say modern education is like a spiritual slaughter house but other times when prabhupada was traveling he would be very happy if he would get to talk with scholars now if they are products of modern slaughter house spiritual slaughter house why spend time with them why respect them at all no but e- even if we say that modern education is not that good but still even to succeed in that one requires intellectual ability one requires talent one requires dedication and proper respected that so there is the model of cultural warfare and in the first generation of iskon that was what was prominent that everything about modern modern culture is bad and has to be rejected and science was also demonized because but we don't have to do that not every single devotee has to adopt the model of cultural warfare there are different ways of spreading and sharing and practicing krishna consciousness so there is also the mode of cultural penetration we accept that there is there are good things in the mainstream culture today by culture i am not just talking about movies and music and things like that I'm just talking about the broad way people live so the scientific science is also a part of today's culture 
So we can use that in Krishna's service, or we can use that for our functioning in the world, so that we can serve Krishna. And Prabhupada, so, so the cultural, cultural adoption or cultural penetration model, if you want to talk about that in our traditional terminology, that is Yukta Vairagya. So Yukta Vairagya means whatever can be used in Krishna's service, we use that. So if modern scientific knowledge can help us in Krishna's service, then why not? Mm. Uh, we can use it. Mm. So uh, we actually have absolutely no control uh, of the situation in which we are placed, the way the whole society operates uh, materially. And if it operates in a specific way, then are a few a, a specific perspective also works in that context. So if we pick that up, that's most uh, uh, the path of least resistance, being in this situation, using things which work in this context. That's what Yukta Vairagya is. A few things just work. Yeah. I, and the, the, see, the, the word path of least resistance has a slightly negative connotation. It means as if we, we don't want to fight, we're just taking the easy way out. But it's not the easy way out. Yeah. It is the way that fulfills our purpose. See, it's like uh, we have to fight battles for being Krishna conscious. But we don't have to fight more battles than necessary. <laughs> what do I mean that? That yes, we have to raise our, raise our consciousness from the material to the spiritual level. But, say for example, with respect to the moon, moon issue. Now Prabhupada has made six, seven different kinds of statements on the moon issue. So I have a, on my YouTube channel, there's a whole Prabhupada's positions on the moon issue. There are all those statements I've analyzed. So sometimes the devotees take one statement, Prabhupada said man didn't go to the moon. And then that becomes a big faith issue. Did we go, did we not go? Now, there is, if somebody wants to make, make the case man didn't go to the moon, there is credible evidence for that. But not everybody will find it credible. And does one have to, is that have to be a central thing when somebody is coming to Krishna conscious? If you see the approach that Prabhupada took in the introduction of Krishna book, Prabhupada is very non-committal. He says that, we have endeavored, man has endeavored a lot to raise himself to the moon, but the but he has not raised his, endeavored much to raise his consciousness. The Bhagavad Gita will guide you how to raise your consciousness. But the point is you have endeavored so much here, endeavor here also. Now, whether that endeavor was productive, whether that endeavor was delusional, whether it was all a straight up, that's a different issue. That doesn't have to be the central point. So is that a battle we even have to fight? So Prabhupada says in the seventh canto, we have to always keep our mind and intelligence healthy and stout to differentiate the purpose of life from a life full of problems. To differentiate the purpose of life from a life full of problems. There may be hundred problems around me, but solving the hundred problems is not the purpose of my life. What is the purpose of my life? And for that, what problems do I need to solve? Let me focus on those. So, there may be many conceptions in the world, some of them may be correct, some of them may not be correct. But correcting all of them is not our purpose, raising our consciousnesses. And if some, some conceptions in the world are obstructing us in that, then that is a problem. So, do you, so Krishna consciousness was presented by Prabhupada at the time of counterculture. Counterculture means that those people didn't have faith in anything mainstream. They didn't have faith in modern education, they didn't have the hippies basically. And the counterculture, they didn't have faith in modern education, modern uh, the religion at their times, the government at their times. And they didn't have faith in, in, in the accomplishments of the claim by the government. So in one sense, when Prabhupada said that we did not go to the moon, that resonated with them. Because you know, people always, they had a lot of skepticism toward the establishment. So at that time, what? Oh yeah, that was, oh, this Swami is so bold as to make such a statement, like, live like that. It appealed to people. But today, that may not appeal, that may alienate people. So we have to differentiate between strategy and purpose. Strategy is a tool, purpose is what we primarily want. The moon issue was a strategy that was circumstantially used by Prabhupada. But that is not what we need to use today. So whatever works, we use it and move forward in our Krishna consciousness. Thank you very much. Granthraj Srimad Bhagavatam ki, Shila Prabhupad ki, Gaur Bhakta Vrind ki, Tai Gaur Primande.